turn it up, throw em up, turn it up, wild out, turn it up, for the Lord, now turn it up, here we come, turn it up, Jesus, turn it up, set it all, turn it up, turn it up, now turn it back. up, the boy spits flame like his stove tops, Damn. hear me scream Jesus on the project rooftops, that's me, huh. that's how bold I am, 25, that's how old I am, all them secular rappers, watch me scold them in, I stand for Christ like y'all in the paint, go hard like Ray Lewis bits the block with the word You say Christ is not real, the nerve I bump false religion like cars bump them curves Not just rapping, I'm teaching Like hands, I'm reaching This large generation, born again Regeneration or jail time, incarceration Either or, that's your decision We handle scriptures with surgery precision You're sleeping, please pay attention Or get held back like after school detention Not to mention, the fact that we bless See you walking around, looking all stressed So when we turn it up Chapter by chapter over both books. Uh, it's going to be covering uh, around 300 years of biblical history and events. So we're going to take our time going through these uh, chapters because there's a lot. Some chapters may take two weeks. Some chapters might take three weeks. That's how much is in both of these books. So we just want you guys to bear with us and be uh, patient as we go through uh, each of these books. Uh, Brother Rick, the voice, are you in position to, uh, to read, starting from verse 17, chapter 2, brother? Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is sent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now Eli, Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Let's stop right and there, he said unto the, Let me read, we'll finish 23. Go ahead. You can stop after 23. I'm sorry. Go ahead, brother. And he said unto them, Why do ye, do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, brother Rick uh, read 17 to 23. So there's a lot that's going on in these uh, verses. I don't, you know, and when we left off, we talked about the sins of Eli's sons that uh, uh, Brother Cal uh, and Minister Ron and Minister Cal did a great job talking about those crimes that was being committed with the Lord's um, offering by these men who were raised to be priests. Uh, they were raised to walk in a, uh, into the role of priests underneath Eli, their father, and they begin to when we talked about, they started to take from the uh, the offering and do all uh, these crimes against God. But before we even fast forward into there, the powerful thing is that meanwhile, while they were committing these crimes, God was already preparing to raise up Samuel. You know, like Samuel was already in training. One thing about um, we say in this ministry, your replacement's always waiting. Your replacement's always waiting. You don't want to do the things for the Lord. The Lord ain't like man. He ain't going to be sitting there crying and worried. He has a replacement ready. So as they was falling short, Samuel was, was already in place to be the replacement that God needed to be the, the priest that he that was going to do the correct things and do the things that's authorized by God to do. So we have to be careful. We don't want to get replaced from the space that God has, from the work that God has for us. That's just a side note. But back to my, my major point is the fact that Eli's sons, they were, they were committing crimes. They was taking the offering and selling it to the Gentiles, flipping that money. They was taking what belonged to God and using it for themselves, right? But they also were sleeping with the with the woman, right? They they said that the um, you read it so eloquently that served at the tabernacle. Now they, this was this this wasn't. A, I want to get a little more technical. This this wasn't just no random act of them just getting attracted to a woman and they just want to be with them and you know, nah, it wasn't that. They had wives. These priests had wives already. Okay? They were basically mimicking adultery worship 
basically the other nations, the way they worship their false gods was through these, these elaborate orgies and sexual worship. So what they would do is they would get these women, um, have sex with them without having no ties to uh, uh, responsibility, accountability, you know, a commitment. They would just go in there and lay with these women with no type of, uh, you know, care or remorse. But it was done in the name of, of worship, you know. It was done in the name of God. So their crimes they was committing was, was atrocious. It was profane, you know. It wasn't this regular stuff here. It was mimicking uh, adultery worship, you know, in the name of God, in the name of the true and living God. So they was tasting, taking false worship, but it was connected to the true and living God's name. Brother Cal, see your hand up and get to you in one second, brother. And the thing, the thing is that we have to understand that this wasn't this no average crime being committed here. Like, you know, this wasn't, it was a lot deeper than that. They was the descendants of the Korth Korthites. So they was already, um, you know, bred and raised to walk into the statues of what a priest is. They was bred in that. It wasn't raised like a regular child would be raised. So when they got in the world, instead of them saying, this ain't for us. They stood in the world, they kept God's name on it, but it God had nothing to do with anything they was doing. So God's name was on everything, but God wasn't involved. And to take it one step further before I pass the minister uh, to the bishop, God, among the people, it was a sin and a crime to look at the things of God like it's a joke, like it's like it's not real, you know, you know, in a hearty way. Like, that ain't, get out of here with that. That's as phony as fake. These, 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 it was very serious, the offering to God, you know, the role of a priest. And the people began to look at the priesthood and the, uh, you know, the offerings of God and the tabernacle like it was just a joke. They began to be like, that's, that is, that's, this is, this is crazy. So it was almost like they laughed and made fun of it. So basically what they did was they made people more comfortable ridiculing God. It's like today, a lot of these ministries do. You see people making fun of these ministries and, all the stuff that they do, they, they really make God to be a joke, to be mocked. They help people mock God by their foolishness and their false doctrine that they teach in a lot of these ministries. And that's a serious, serious crime. God is very serious. This is very serious business. You know, he's a holy God. We have to make sure we represent um, when we, in ministry and doctrinally. We have to represent that in a true way. We can't have you coming in there and you come in for these elaborate performances and acrobatic tricks in these ministries, man. And people were like, what is going on in here? And we're making God to look like he's just some type of joke. And people are laughing because we're, we're basically, it's like, it's like, for example, before I pass it to Brother Cal, you were, we're serious men. Every man on this call, I believe, is a serious man. But if I walk around here with a sign that you a joke and I have everybody believing that, you're going to be like, yo, why are you, you know, putting me out here? Like, I'm just some type of uh, spectacle, you know? God's not a spectacle. He's a holy God. But a lot of these ministries... They make God to be portrayed as one. And because of that, they are in trouble. It's an indictment list coming from heaven because of these ministries and what they do. And that's one of the supply application to the text. And Brother Cal, go ahead, brother. The floor is yours, brother. Amen. Amen. There's a lot in that. You covered 85% of it. Um, not only that, see, we said the last last week, right? We said that that it said they knew not the Lord. It said they were men of Belial. Now, anytime that word men of Belial is used in scriptures, mean they was ruthless, gangsters. They didn't follow their conscience. They only followed their appetites. That was all that moved them. I grew up with guys like that. And I was one of them at one time where all I cared about was, you know, self-gratification. You know, what can I get for myself? Self, 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 self. Everything started with them and ended with them. Right. So their mindset towards God was an abomination. They didn't believe. They said they knew not the Lord. They didn't care. They just used that platform to get whatever they could benefit for themselves. And that's all they did, those priests. And I like what Mike said. God already had a replacement for them in Samuel because Samuel's from the court of the line, too. His family's from the same line. God already chose that man. Sometimes the people who we think it is, that's not them. 
Even Amen. though they were raised up in the priesthood, they whole life from babies all the way to men, they heard about how we said this last week, how to operate in the priesthood and carry out the certain ordinances and everything. They knew this from babies, from three, four, five, six years old, they, they was being prepared. But in all of that instruction, they never had a connection. They never had a relationship with God. See, sometimes we could receive a lot of instructions. Even our children. I gave my children a lot of instruction. I got my son on the line. Now. I gave my children a lot of instruction growing up. It doesn't mean it's going to stick or it's going to stay. <laughs> There's no guarantees with that. I'm sure Eli told them, you know, this is what God expects from you. But their unbelief blocked it like a force field. See, unbelief is what kills everything. Unbelief just blocks everything. There's things in scripture where we hear it. Let's be real. Some of the supernatural things or some of the things in that Bible, we'd be like, I, I don't know. That sounds a little far-fetched. Once that unbelief kicks in, that's what blocks your relationship. That's what blocks your growth. That's what blocks you from getting all that God has from you. God can't work in no unbelief for him. That's not where he works at. So this is what really hurt them in the beginning. So their unbelief turned them into enemies against God. It turned them into men of Belial, wicked men, ruthless men, right? We talked about them last week, right? Not only that, the mindset, see what happens, see, it got to go, one word Mike left out, said no responsibility, no accountability, right? No commitment to what they were doing, especially those women. But also, what, what does Satan take away to get us to do these things? It's something that Satan does. He started in the garden, way back in the garden. What did he tell Eve? You shall not surely die if you disobey God. Make sure you mute your phones, guys. Everybody has to mute their phones. He said, you shall not surely die if you disobey God. It's not, you're not going to die. Nothing's going to happen. See, once Satan removes the consequence, that, that turns us into, friend, into a frenzy, a free for all. We do what we want to do. We're not worried about it. We're not worried about hell. Ain't no such thing as hell. Satan been lying to that, lying to people about that since the Garden of Eden. Ain't no such thing as hell. Ain't no retribution. Ain't no consequence. See, he removes the consequence, and then that sends us out there thinking that we're going to do what we want to do, and it ain't going to be no consequence. See, he took the consequences. It's obviously that these young men didn't know that their life was about to end. That their unbelief was going to lead them headlong into, you know, into a, a direct confrontation with the Holy God. They, see, that's what Satan does to people, millions of people today all over the world. He uses their unbelief to make them believe there won't be no consequence. And this is what basically, I believe this was the, the fuel or the engine that drove these young men right, to their death, you know, to their demise. But that's all I want to say, Brother Mike, get back to you. Amen, Brother. Uh, okay. Amen, praise the Lord. That was powerful, Brother. Um, the powerful thing is, is that one that word consequence as well, when um, the mindset is very important, uh, God looks at the mindset, you know, the mindset, sometimes the mindset is the biggest crime. It's not the act. You know, we get so caught up in the act, but your mindset is the, is what God really looks at. You know, if you fall short or go through something, you know, in the area of a, a female or, or anything in your life, but your mindset is demonic. Your mindset is a mindset that I just don't care. I don't want to take responsibility. And those words that you have to have, all men on this call, any woman you deal with, God does not want you to have a mindset that I'm going to deal with them and throw them away after I'm done. Any woman that we connect ourselves with, these are the things that you must have. We're going to go through them one more time for you guys that didn't hear. You must have a mindset to be committed to them. You must have a mindset to take responsibility for them. You have to also have a mindset to take accountability. And you also have to be mindful of the consequences of the kind of women you choose to deal with. All those things have to run through our minds when we are dealing with a woman that we choose to want to be with. You know, you deal with a woman, you got to say, OK, I, I got to take responsibility for what I want to get myself into here. You know, we have to have that right mindset. You know, and that's very, very important. And, and one thing about these men, like Brother Cal said, they didn't have that mindset. They didn't care. Only thing they cared about is benefiting for themselves. 
they turned they turned these women that was there to worship God, they turned them into ritual prostitutes. That's what they did. They talked, they turned them into ritual prostitutes. Ritual prostitutes were uh women that worked in these false temples or to these false gods, and they were there having these sexual orgies, and some of them had children. You know, back then there was no contraceptives, you know, and things that we have today, like birth control and all that. So these women got pregnant, and most of those men and women that had children, children was just thrown out in the streets. And in the false, in them false religions, a lot of them children was also uh, burnt on an altar and were and, um, used as, uh, you know, as burnt offerings to them false gods. So to the so, god, to the god Moloch, they called yeah, it Moloch. Exactly. It was it was a lot going on here, man. This is very demonic that was taking place. But the problem is today, I fast forward that to the day, and we still have demonic-minded individuals. There's women out here with that same spirit on them. You know, they don't care about knowing God. They don't care about knowing you. They just care about what they could what they could profit and gain from you, and that's all they care about. And you have to be careful for women like that too, men. You know that we come in contact with, that hate God. We talked about that last week. If they hate God, they're not going to love you. I don't care how, how great you think you are. You know, we talked about that. So that spirit is still at work today in women today. Not all, but a lot of them. So you have to be very careful and be very wise on the decision and choice you made of the woman that you choose to make your partner in life. That is one of the most important decisions outside of, you know, your ministry <laughs> that you're going to make in your life is who you decide to connect yourself with as a helpmate. So I just want to make that a side note. Um, we talked about the false worship. One thing, uh, one thing, like I said, Brother Cal, I think he covered everything. The rest of the things I wanted to say about, you know, what their mindset was and what they were, um, you know, what they were doing. The main thing is, like I said before, the biggest crime is that they made God, rep they took God's reputation and lowered his reputation. He's God. We have to make sure that we are, we're representing Christ the right way, doctrinally. Doctrinally. I know a lot of people today that represent Christ emotional, in an emotional way, but they don't represent Christ the right way, doctrinally. And by the time you give people the doctrine that you believe, it's so much confusion that it's being laughed at. They're looking at you like, that's the God? That's the God of the Bible? So you're making people feel comfortable in their sin and in their lives that they're living in. The Bible has to be preached in context so people can truly understand how deep and how powerful the God of the Bible is. When he's not taught and preached the right way, he's, he's to be set to be ridiculed. And what happens is doctrinally, it's very important that we have the right doctrine. If not, we're going to make people feel more comfortable and more stable in their lives, you know, and all that foolishness that they believe. We don't preach that gospel the right way. That's why we're so, so serious about the doctrine today, guys. All right. Uh, Brother Rick, uh, we talked about this. I think we covered that. This, but, but basically the sins of uh, Eli's sons. Now we're going to move on a little bit and get into, uh, you know, how... Hey, uh, uh, brother, brother Mike, I want to add something to what you said. And back to that, we can't preach uh, a gospel void of consequences neither, right? Amen. That's right, brother. We can't preach a gospel void of consequences. Young wow. men on this phone, brother, whatever you threw, do. I mean, we're not going to go to hell for it. Right. There's a message that uh, we preached years ago and the title of uh, of the message was be careful what you do, because a curse might come with that. Right. There's curses that comes with certain mindset and certain attitudes, as we see what happened to Eli's. We're about to see what happened to his sons. But my point is that whatever we do that God doesn't approve of. Whatever decision we make that he does not even now, we ain't going to go to hell for it, but he's going to make sure we understand that he did not like it. He's not going to let us get away with it. He will bring it to our account and remind us. Sometimes God takes a long time in doing things. We think, you know, God is good with things. God will say, remember 15 years ago when you did that? I didn't like that. I didn't like your attitude towards that. That's why we always, whatever we do, we have to have be conscious and have a repentive mindset towards it. the things we do. We know that God does not appreciate. We can't just overlook it. Or make it seem like it ain't nothing because God will bring it to our account. I just want to say that, Mike. That's all. Yeah, brother, powerful. Yeah, uh, yeah. Minister Ron, you have anything you want to add before we move on to the text, or beloved? Yeah, uh, and it's, it's amazing that you say that, but that that's, goes into a lot of where we, if you notice that our baptisms, uh, we've had the doing 
we always let those people understand that, you know, now is when the attacks come because when you become saved, obviously you have a new mindset. And so what happens is, you know, at first glance, you say, well, everything is great, you know, and it is, don't get me wrong. It is, it's wonderful. But again, like Bishop said, a lot of the damage that we have done in the past, those things still exist. And even though God has brought us to a position of awareness uh, of those things, we still got to be truthful that those ramifications still exist. Now, again, like Bishop said, God, you in the fold. Come on in. We got you. But the things that you have done, this is why we always say, stay aware, understand what's going on. Yes, you are saved, but a lot of the problems and the conditions that you've done in the past, they don't just disappear, right? So we try to get you through that as best we can. Amen. Good point. Amen, brother. Uh, brother, brother Rick, you want to keep coming down? I think we stopped at 24. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord said, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Stop right there, brother. Stop at verse 30. Thank you, brother. Brother Rick read 24 from 30. So what's happening right here? What, what's going on? God is basically... Eli, well, before I get into what God was, was proclaiming, Eli basically tells his son, hey, guys, the report and things we're hearing about what you guys are doing is spreading throughout the city. It's spreading throughout the land. And um, I like what he says. He says, I, I love what he says. Here. He says, if, if you have a, if he said, who can, who can, um, you know, when you have a problem with someone else, so God can intervene. But who can intervene when you have problems with the Lord? I like that. That, that kind of touched me. And the powerful thing is, you know, I'm not, people, we so worry about who we got a problem with, but most people have a problem with God. They walk around like that's nothing. See, you got to be careful. I don't want to have a problem with God. <laughs> you know, we don't have problems with people in life, guys. But make sure you don't have a problem with God because that's the one you don't want to have a problem with. Amen. So people are so focused on having problems with people and having these different issues with individuals and these different beefs and different things like that. But people have a beef with God today. They act like it's nothing. This is a serious problem. You don't want that as they say smoke. You know, I'd rather have problems with I'd rather have problems with men than have problems with God. So that's why I make the stands that I make my the stands I make sometimes. So I have to make these, I have to stand on my convictions against my family, against friends sometimes, against people, because I don't want no beef with God. I don't I, I don't want no 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 have an issue with the true living God. Some people, God have a God have a serious issue with a lot of people today, and they're so worried about being in harmony. With people around them, but they're not worried about being in harmony with God, and that's a problem. We have to make sure that our mindset is focused on being in harmony with God first, above everything, and then everybody else after. We got to make sure our mindset, once again, is in harmony with God, and that we're looking to be in harmony with God. Because one thing about um, having problems with God, no one can intercede or fix that when you have a problem with God. That's a, that's something that uh you know you don't want to have in your life, and I noticed that people. They ignore their relationship with God and focus on all these other relationships, you know, that's that's, that's temporal and external and short-lived. But our relationship with God is eternal. So we don't want to have that mindset. Now, Amen. 
the powerful part I like too is that he says to them, he says, he says one thing about Eli, he tells them, he, re, he rebukes them, but they continue operating as priests. He never, he never relinquishes their role. He said, you guys got fat off my offerings. You guys profit, you know, you're profited off my offering. He said, the fact that you guys being the descendants of Aaron, we understand what they were. There was another Levitical priest. So you guys were supposed, his house, like one thing about Eli's house, he was so, always was supposed to have someone from his uh, lineage or his genealogy to be a part of, you know, to serve before God. And God was basically saying, that's not going to happen anymore. I'm going to, I'm going to eradicate your, your, your whole genealogy from operating as priests. See, God is a God that deals with our whole genealogy. He doesn't just see us in our lifetimes. He sees uh, uh, Sean's genealogy. He sees uh, Deacon Brown's genealogy, right? He sees uh, genealogy means your, your whole family tree, your whole branch, right? He sees everything. And one thing, that, guys, you have to be very careful. The things that we're doing now is going to affect our genealogy. The things that you do right now are going to affect, uh, I told Minister Ron this. I said, Jalen, Jalen is, is his son. I said, the things you're doing right now is going to affect his grandchildren. That's like three generations down. We can, we can affect our genealogies for Christ, or we, can, uh, or we can also destroy our genealogies by our rebellion. You know, We have to be very careful of how we move in our lifetimes because it affects many people coming down the line. We are all men on this call. This is a men's Bible study. It's nothing like us thinking about our genealogies and if our in the, in the old days to say, "Well, I want my name to last in the land." You know, it was very important for kings to have sons because their name lived on, right? So the problem is that we serve a God that if you <laughs> that He can He'll eradicate, He'll erase and destroy genealogies. This man' whole lineage as a priest was about to be wiped out because of his disobedience of allowing of allowing his sons to continue on. And their rebellion and not pulling them and making them and making them step down. He loved his sons more than he loved the Lord. And it was and it, it was to his uh his demise, unfortunately, as we're going to continue reading. But my point about this right now is that we have to be careful of how we walk and what we do because it's going to affect our generations to come, guys. Don't get so caught up in your lifetime and not realizing that for those of uh, here who have children and if their children go and they have fathers and they have sons. Your genealogy and your whole line and lineage is affected by what you do today. See, God sees our whole genealogies before us. He doesn't just see you. He sees your whole family line. God is so eternal. He sees, see, see one thing about God, he sees the ending and the beginning. So he understands what my, what Christian, which is my son's, what his great grandson's going to be. If, if God chooses to allow they go, this, this earth to go that far, but he sees the whole genealogy. And he basically told Eli, you, your whole lineage, your genealogy as priest is over. That's powerful. Amen. We have to be very careful of what we do, guys. You affect, you will affect your 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 offspring to come if we if we decide to to not really fall in line with God. We could set our a course. We could set our genealogies uh, back. You know, I look at my mother and my aunt Jackie, and they. And my great they, they grandmother raised them, and there's things that, that my, listen, my great grandmother's been gone a long time, but she tried to serve the Lord the best she can. And before she died, she said, I don't know how they're going to turn out, but I gave them Jesus. But she, if she was alive, she'll be so blessed to see what, what they are, how they love the Lord today. You understand? We, look, guys, we don't know. We, don't, we Listen, we have to be very mindful of what we're doing now, what we're laying down for Christ now. Because when we're no longer around, you know, our people. children's children's children Amen. will continue serving God. We got to make sure we can't get so caught up in our, our everyday worries and our little lifetime on earth that we forget to make sure we put things in place for our children's children's children to be powerful men and women of God. This is a this is a real serious thing here. We get so caught up in our little 80 years here on earth. I think life expectancy is something around here. It's not that's not very long. I'm 43 years old. I remember being 17 yesterday. Time is life is a vapor of smoke, guys. Make sure Amen. that that you, that you uh, set uh, the gospel in such a way that when your son has a son and he has a son, that they can understand that they need Jesus. Set that up for them. Amen? Set that up. Set that course now. That's how we should be thinking as men on this call with sons and with children. Amen? I just want to uh, understand uh, that because one thing about God, God sent the curse on this man's whole genealogy. Brother Rick has a daughter. 
Brother Rick's daughter has a son, right? She, she, her, his daughter may share things that were shared from Brother Rick about Jesus at his son. We don't know what his her son will be, his son's son would be. Now, Rick, Rick's long gone. We long gone in glory at that time. We're talking about three generations down. I'm just using this as an example, guys, meaning that God sees that. God see, God saw uh, Calvin's father's uh, children. Saw He saw Calvin. He saw Jeremiah. Isaiah, he saw all that back then when that man was walking the earth before Calvin was born. See, God is, God is powerful, man. It's profound, you know, how God sees our whole family lines. We have to be very careful to make sure that we may be impactful for Christ so it could affect and um and, and be a blessing to our kids to come. All right. So we're gonna move on. Amen, brother. Um, Amen. I know I touched on that point a million times, but we're gonna move on, guys. All right. Um let's keep coming down, brother Rick. Anybody else have anything to share before we move on? Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about Eli, but I know you're gonna go into it, brother. So go ahead. I'm yes, about to go into Eli right now. Uh, Brother Rick, you ready to come down? Yeah. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phineas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Stop right there. Brother Rick just read to 34. Now this is profound. He said there will not be a man in your, in your, uh, your line your genealogy, that's going to be old. I will cut them off at the prime of their lives. This is really a serious, what he says to him. Now, Eli, for a minute, you know, father, try to serve Lord, the Lord the best he can. Had a lot to do with calling, you know, calling Samuel and dealing with Samuel. But he didn't stand against his sons. See, the hardest thing to do is stand against our children, man, when they, when they rebel against God. You know, he didn't stand against them. You know, he, re he, 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 re he rebuked them, but he continued letting them operate that way. You know, like I said, he adorned his sons more than he, he reverenced the Lord. And for that, his, his consequences was grave. There's a time we have to stand against, taking this step further, guys, there's a time we have to stand against our loved ones, the people we love the most. We have to stand against them. The rebuke is not enough. Sometimes it's a rebuke. It's not enough. We have to stand against our very loved ones, the people that we love the most. We have to stand against them. And we and we have to have the courage in Christ Jesus to do that. And if we don't do that, we find ourselves in trouble as well. You know, we don't want to have to do that at times. We don't want to stand against our own children, our own family members, our own lives, our own best friends, people that we felt like they were from the grain with us, came up with us. But there's going to be times we have to stand against the people that we love the most. And we have to be, we have to be able to do it, we cannot not do it. We cannot be the people that say we're not going to stand against them. They are full-fledged rebellion against God. He was supposed to remove them from their titles and tell them to step down as priests, and he didn't do it. He continued watching them do violence to God's word, to the offering, to everything that God was about. And God said, because you allowed it and because you didn't stand against them, I'm going to deal with your whole family line. I'm going to deal with your whole lineage. We have to be very careful to stand against those people that God cause us to stand against. And though it might hurt us, though it might affect us, there's men that I met in, throughout my ministry, throughout being a Christian, guys, that I haven't talked to in years. I had to stand against them for doctrinal reasons. They were very close to me. Loved them dearly. But they went left. They detoured from the truth. And I had, to stand, I had to stand against them. And it hurt me to do that. And I'm telling you sometimes, guys, you don't have to make stands against the people you love the most when it comes to this, this gospel. When it comes to this truth, and if you don't do it, if you enable them, if you sit there and continue to entertain it, you're going to have a problem on your own hands as well. That blood will be on your hands. You don't want that. Faithful to the wounds of a friend, and the truth will set you free. It's impossible to say you love someone and don't tell them the truth. Amen, brother. That's powerful. Amen. Amen. Moving on, brother. Uh, brother Cal, we move on to brother uh, Ron. You have anything else you want to add, brother? Moving on. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, 
One, I love what you said, right, about, you know, my father and my uncle, this is a personal testimony. My grandmother was a Christian. She always tried her best to challenge him, you know, a little weak faith, because my great-grandmother, they said, was like an evangelist. Said she walk up and down on country roads with her Bible sharing to anybody and everybody riding by on their horses, whatever, because my great-grandmother go way back. But my point is, is this. My father and my uncle rebelled against it completely. They lived their own lives. They gave, you know, the gospel their butts to kiss. And I outlived both of them. They didn't live. They died. They died very young, both of them, right? Because I put my trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says a disobedient child days will be cut short, right? God is, once you hear, see, God will give you a shot, right? But once you hear the true, authentic gospel, your time is up. Your time is running out. Wow. See, there's a lot of stuff that masquerades itself as the gospel out here today. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fake Jesuses out here. There's a lot of fake gospels out here. God will give you a break on that stuff. But once you get the truth, once you get that raw, uncut, undul adulterated gospel, ain't no more games out there. I love the way Paul put it when he was on Miles Hill, right? When he says, you know, the God y'all ignorantly worship, right? But he said, now I'm here today. He said, it's time to clean out these shrines. It's time to get this nonsense out of here because your time is up. He said, it's over. He said, God let it go, but now I'm here now. He sent me here. From this day forth, y'all going to be held accountable for everything, all of this nonsense y'all believe in. So my point is, God is patient. He says, he says, the God you ignorantly worship. When you ignorant, when you uninstructed, uninformed, unlearned, don't know better. God, he give you some time. But once the raw uncut comes to you, time is up. Repentance has to be not. You have to acknowledge the errors of your ways. You have to confess it. You got to let God know he's real. You cannot continue in your foolishness, especially if you're raised like that. You see what's happening to Eli's sons when you're brought up in Christ. I wasn't brought up in Christ. I heard Christ when I was, you know, almost 20. My mother didn't give it to me that way. I wasn't brought up like that. To be honest with you, I led my mother in the sinner's prayer. You know, my brother's on the phone. When I was in prison, me and her did the sinner's prayer, right? So my point is, right, God will have mercy. He will be patient with us, you know? He will work with us, but we got to make sure once, you know, again, once that truth comes, that's that. That's that. All right, brother Ron, I'll give it back to you. Wow, amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Powerful, brother uh, Ron. Uh, you have anything you want to add, brother? Before we go, we close out. But we a couple last scriptures that we're going to close. I do. Out. I just want to bring the home that accountability. That's powerful. Um, but I, I don't want to stop with just our biological accountability. And as you and Bishop alluded to, we also have accountability to our spiritual brothers and sisters who's on this call, people who are led to us spiritually. So when we don't call into account, you know, uh, the things that we preach and teach, this is why, if you've noticed, uh, sometimes it takes us a while to get through certain uh, uh, books because again, everything goes through a checks and balance system that we have here at Hard Drive Ministries. And it may not look like that because we're just ordinary people like everybody else, but we take a lot of time, we invest a lot of time and energy in what we share because we understand that God calls us into account for everything that comes off of this platform. And it's not just sharing now with a couple of brothers in, the, in a barbershop like we used to, or in a couple of people's homes. Now we're on the World Wide Web, so everything that goes forth can affect people we don't even know, we don't even never met before. So we have to be very, very careful that we are accountable to everyone that God gives us the scripture to. And just like Bishop is saying, those excuses of we don't know anymore, uh, those, are, those are gone. Um, one other thing I want to say, too, is the accountability has to supersede every possible biological trend. And for now, we know we're coming up into these elections. We have to even supersede the political persuasion, guys. Your political views should never, ever cross connect with what's going on in this Bible, right? The word of God should always supersede everything. Political persuasion, race, creed, color, you name it, guys, because we will take that into account. God is absolutely very, very aware of everything that we share 
as ministers of the gospel. That's all I had to say there. Amen, bro. Hey, uh, Brother Mike, I meant to add one last thing. You said something about Eli. Eli did rebuke his sons, right? But he didn't go, he didn't go all the way through. He went halfway, halfway. See, God is a God that wants us to go all the way. Like he told them they was wrong, but then he did he left them, you know, he left them still rock out. Right? God wants us not just to be about talk. He don't always want us to just be talking about this. He don't always just want us on his phone just chopping it up and just talking about it, but there's no action behind. The word of God, when God deals with you, it should always move you to action. When Moses was dealing, and I'm going to say this, when Moses, when he chose the priesthood is when he said, who's on the Lord's side? This is why he chose the priesthood, right? The Levitical, the Levites. And they said, when they, during the golden calf rebellion, Moses came back down from the mountain. He seen them going crazy, right? So he said, wait a minute, who's on the Lord's side? And they, they said, the, they said, the Levites stood by Moses. And then he said, okay, now it's time to prove it. Everybody pick up a sword and cut down who was, I don't care who it is, during the Golden Calf Rebellion. He said, I don't care if it's your cousin, your auntie, your sister. He said, they got to go. Whoever was a part of that, cut them down. And it was the, the, the Levites, the tribe of Levi is the ones who cut them down. And that's why they had that position, because they proved it by action. See, God is a God of action. He don't want us to go halfway through nothing. He wants us to go all the way. And that's the hard part for us. Amen. Everybody on this phone. When God is saying, nah, you got to follow this through. You got to go all the way. You got to take a stand against it. I know you love that one. I know that's your favorite. I know this one. You got to take that stand and you got to follow it through. That's all I want to say. Powerful point, bro. Let's, uh, let's come down and wrap up this uh, chapter two. Um, points of very powerful, very powerful book. This chapter is a phenomenal chapter. Uh, Brother Rick, let's read these last couple verses and close out this uh, this chapter. Bro. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm, the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation and all the wealth which God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and shall say, put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices that I may eat a piece of bread. Amen. That's the end of chapter two. Thank you, brother, for closing that out. Um, God basically, um, he sent for consequences for uh, Eli not following through and for the profane uh, crimes very very flagrant crimes that the uh, Eli sons committed he said and I will raise up for myself a faithful priest we all know that was going to be Samuel who should do according to what is in my heart and mind see God not God is not just worried about our actions and our struggles as a uh, as having a sin nature right he wants us to have a, the heart of God and the mind of God we have to have the heart of God and the mind of God that's what this is about. If you don't have the heart of God and the mind of God, if you can't mimic those two things, then you truly don't understand what this Christian thing is about. We should be thinking the way he thinks and feeling the way he feels. There's so many people right now getting their morals in check and working on getting their self together, but their hearts and minds are so horrible. Their attitudes are so horrible. They're only concerned about themselves. Their, their Christianity starts and stops with them. We have men out here today committing atrocious crimes in Jesus' name right now, getting millions off people's back, robbing them, you know, stealing from them, operating in legalism, capitalism. And I don't care how unique and how and how orderly and how nice the building looks, they're committing these crimes. They don't have the mind and the heart of God. 
And we pray that the men on this call has the heart and the mind of God. If you have those things, you can't fail. If you have the true, got the true of living word and the right doctrine and the heart and the mind of God, no matter what you go through, no matter what you find yourself at in life, God will always work with you, like Brother Cal said. You have to make sure that we are mindful and setting up things the way God wants to set up. And that's the that's the most important thing I want you guys to walk away with in this chapter. Um, and that's it. Wow. This chapter, good. Man. Powerful. Now gonna close out we're gonna pray out uh any final remarks for anyone the floor is open i'm so happy that uh my brother brandon is on the call um so happy to see him uh and it's chapter two father god i thank you for bringing us all together this sunday we come together preach over your word talk over your word and for watching over us uh making sure that uh, we're good. And also I pray that we can take take away from today's Bible study, take away everything that we need and apply it to our lives so that we are able to serve you. And Jesus' name, amen.